Jim Capshu. I'm the moderator of the Digital Humanities Symposium uh, today. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, I'm a um, visiting scholar at the Center for the Humanities at OSU. I'm enjoying my time here. I'm actually teaching. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Um, back in the Midwest, where I come from, there's a saying that if March comes in like a lamb, it will go out like a lion. But luckily, we're going to be all on spring break when that, when that <laughs> happens, so it doesn't matter. A note for the freshmen among you, this is the Digital Humanities Symposium. What is a symposium? <clears throat> it's a Latin term from ancient Greek roots, meaning convivial meeting or party from drinking and intellectual conversation. <laughs> Okay. Knowing the Greeks and Romans, I suspect alcohol was involved. <laughs> Let's help yourself to refreshments here. <laughs> in contrast to some of the young people in this room who were born digital, I grew up in the last days of analog dominance. In high school in the 1970s, I took a typewriting course. In my graduate school years, in the early 1980s, I took research notes on 3 by 5 cards, similar to the ones in the library's card catalog, and typed drafts of my dissertation on an electric typewriter. I bought a personal computer in 1985 with 256 kilobytes of memory and completed a final version of my thesis on it. I worked for 10 years in government laboratories and universities before email became ubiquitous in the, in the mid-1990s. My first foray in online teaching occurred in 2000. And now I'm teaching a course in digital history where the students are responsible for investigating the fascinating history of Waldo Hall, the first woman's dorm on this campus, and creating an online exhibit that will be displayed on the LSU website. And these are my students here. Uh, I'm glad they all Okay, so today we're going to have short uh, position pieces from the, the four scholars uh, in front of you, and then we'll have a general discussion. So uh, I'm going to first introduce, um, it's in uh, reverse order from the, uh, the, uh, the flyer. Uh, our first speaker is Professor Daniel Rosenberg, Rosenberg who is a professor of history Assistant Dean of the Honors College at the University of Oregon. His 2010 book, Cartography of Time, A History of the Timeline, co-authored by Anthony Grafton, examines the way historical events and processes are depicted in diagrams. He has presented his work on diagrams to a number of digital industry groups, including the Facebook design team. Shortly, he will begin a fellowship at the Mach Planck Institute for History of Science in Berlin, where he, where he will be pursuing a new project on history of data. He will be introducing data and data in his presentation. It's nice to be here, it's, uh, nice to, be here to talk about digital humanities, uh, which is something that I don't really practice. Uh, I do, I do have a, a, a project uh, going on right now which is uh, based on the uh, book that Jim mentioned, uh, Cartographies of Time. Uh, for those of you who don't know the book, um, it's a history of timelines, and it's a book full of really extraordinary, lush diagrams, which, it's a big book, it's this sized, uh, but the diagrams, many of them are like this one here, two feet by three feet uh, in real life. Some of the diagrams are 50 or 100 feet long. Um, and so there are challenges to seeing them in the book. So uh, we're now engaged in a project to put some of these online. And uh, it's been a lot of fun, and I'm happy to talk about that in Q&A. It's not what I want to talk about now. Um, I want to talk about data. So my work on data began, as so many investigations do, with a happenstance encounter that eventually became a kind of irritation. In researching cartographies of time, uh, I ran across an odd passage in a work by the 18th century natural philosopher and theologian, Joseph Priestley. 
In his 1788 lectures on history and general policy, Priestley refers to names and dates as the quote unquote data we find in historians. The usage struck me as modern and even felt anachronistic. Of course, if anyone in the 18th century was in a position to formulate a modern concept of historical data, it would have been Priestley. The image that you see projected is Priestley's 1765 chart of biography, a giant double folio graphic representing 3,000 years of world history categorized and laid out according to a linear measure. And all of those little lines you see on there are lifelines for famous people who lived somewhere in that 3,000 year period. Priestley's chart is a monumental achievement in the history of data graphics, arguably the first modern timeline. And in fact, we do argue that. Still, Priestley's use of the term data bothered me. And as I continued my work on him, I noticed it recurring. In his experiments and observations on different kinds of air, 1777, Priestley uses data to refer to measurements of volumes of air. In the evidences of revealed religion from 1794, Priestley says that scripture offers us no data on the physical nature of Christ's resurrected body. All of this raised questions. What was the history of the concept? What was the relationship between the emergent usage in the 18th century and the familiar modern usage? And if the term data did have an earlier importance, didn't it deserve its own history, one that was equal to the histories of terms such as facts and evidence and truth? And there's been a whole sort of spate of books giving histories of these concepts. All of these questions, I think, are that much more compelling since in the recent historiography, including works by Lorraine Daston, Theodore Porter, and Mary Poovey, the term data appears frequently, even doing some very heavy lifting, but is rarely, if ever, remarked upon as a term. Consider, for example, the very first lines of Mary Poovey's great book, A History of the Modern Fact. Here's what she says. What are facts? Are they incontrovertible data that simply demonstrate what is true, or are they bits of evidence marshaled to persuade others of the theory one sets out with? In Poovey's construction, facts may be conceptualized as either theory-laden or incontrovertible. We signal the latter case by calling these facts data. Of course, at this point, it would be very natural for me to attempt a little one-upsmanship. If facts can be deconstructed, surely data can be too. If facts can be shown to be theory-laden, why not data? Yet in my view, there are good reasons to continue using data in precisely the unmarked, undeconstructed manner in which Proofy uses it. I'd just like to understand what makes data a plausible candidate for something we would not want to deconstruct. To get there requires understanding what makes data different from other conceptual entities, and in particular, what makes it different from facts. So, what was data prior to the 19th and 20th centuries, and how did data acquire its pre-analytical, pre-factual status? To get at this, the etymology of the term is not a bad starting point. The English word data is derived from Latin. It is the plural form of data, more datum, which is itself the neuter past participle of the verb dare, to give. A datum is something given in an argument, something taken for granted. This is in contrast to the term fact, which derives from the neuter past participle of the Latin facere, to do, whence we have the fact as that which was done, occurred, or exists. There's an important contrast here. Facts are ontological. Data is rhetorical. It's given an argument. In the influential formulation of Euclid, mathematical problems are structured around two basic elements, the data and the quesita, values that are given, let x equal three, and values that are sought. 
And, in, and this Euclidean framework is one of the key conduits through which the Latin terms datum and data first enter English. In every language that I've examined, except for Latin, of course, the word data is recent, though it appears to emerge first in English. The Oxford English Dictionary finds its earliest usage in a 1646 theological tract that refers to a heap of data. In 17th century English, data was used especially in mathematics, where it retained the technical sense given by Euclid, and in theology, where it referred to scriptural truths that were given in the Bible and therefore about which one could not ask questions. So this is where I was in my research not very long ago. And in any past situation, my steps would have almost certainly have been hermeneutic. My usual plan would have been to read Priestley more extensively and more closely, and of course I did do that, and to use the OD, which I did also. But it occurred to me in this case, with this subject matter and at this historical juncture, it might also be appropriate to try to apply some quantitative tools to take a stab at writing a quantitative history of data. My plan was to begin collecting, categorizing, and counting occurrences of the term data in English in order to specify when the term came into use uh, as a Latin loanword, when it was naturalized, and when it achieved its various connotations, when it became important in common usage. Now, as it happens, um, I performed my very first round of this research shortly before Google publicly debuted its Ngram viewer, <laughs> which provides a neat and easy way to do something like what I did. Uh, Anita's going to talk about some engrams. I just pulled up a couple of my favorites. Uh, there's a lot of debate about whether engrams are just silly or whether they tell you something. So I gave you a little taste of both. Uh, in the Google Books corpus uh, from 1900 to 2000, you see that uh, there are more, more and more occurrences of the word women uh, relative to the term uh, uh, men. And in fact, there are more usages of women in the Google Books corpus uh, after about 1970 than there are of men in the same corpus. I also plotted zombies versus vampires. And I can't, I can probably tell you a story about why women occur more than men after the 70s in our literature, but zombies versus vampires, the, the students will probably have to. There was no one about uh, vampire and, and uh, garlic and cross or anything like that? <laughs> what, I'm sorry? Vampire and garlic. Wow. That would be a nice. Uh, that would be a nice, a nice plot, and you can do, you can plot it in Google. You can plot up to five terms oh, together. Yeah. So I encourage you to do that. <laughs> now, in retrospect, um, I'm both a little uh, happy and a little sad at the timing of the release of the Engram viewer, because um, if it had been released just a little earlier, it would have saved me a lot of work. <laughs> um, but I'm it also, in a way, relieved because. Uh, Working through manually some of the things that Google can do automatically, uh, I think began to give me some insights into the back end of some of these systems that I might not have had uh, otherwise. Um, so this is what one sees when one looks at the long history of data through the lens of the Ngram viewer. On the bottom is Google doing it. On the top is me doing it just by searching for data. And I picked some control words, searching for them year after year after year, and dividing and plotting. Uh, and very nice to see that uh, the manual work actually mirrors uh, what the Ngram viewer produces, uh, which gives us a little more confidence in both, at least as representations of what's inside the system. Now, there are a number of observations we might make and questions we might pose about these plots. But in broad outlines, the story that they suggest is more or less what we might have expected, knowing nothing whatsoever about the quantitative facts of the matter. Broadly speaking, the big historical action appears to take place in the 19th and 20th centuries, during which we see the rise of the concept. What is more, uh, this is a good story, uh, we see, and probably a true story. Fortunately for me, I started my work uh, just before the Ngram viewer went public, and therefore was unconstrained by self-evidence. I also began with a different system, the subscription database ECHO, or 18th century collections online. Uh, 18th Century Collections Online is a primitive tool, and it suffers from many of the well-publicized faults of Google Books, particularly in its scanning quality. What is more, uh, the Echo interface 
seems designed specifically to thwart quantitative inquiry. <laughs> and yet, ECHO has some notable advantages. Its corpus, which is based on the English short title catalog, is well known, well defined, and relatively stable. ECHO provides a couple of very clever uh, proximity searching functions that uh, are not available out of the box uh, from Google. And ECHO has excellent book level metadata, which is something which is almost non existent in Google Books. In fact, a decade ago, one might have thought that ECHO would have had the revolutionary effect on historical scholarship that many now expect Google to produce. I remember a friend of mine at graduate school who first saw this thing, he called it the dissertation machine. <laughs> in my own work uh, in ECHO, I began with a very simple word search, identifying works that contained the word data, searching year by year. Because ECHO is bounded and ultimately not that big, it only contains 136,000 books. It was practical, if time consuming, to examine every one of the approximately 10,000 words in which the term data appears and to apply a well-tested technique for analyzing and classifying them, which I will call reading. As I've said, my, my research in this area is still preliminary, uh, but it has already turned up some results that add nuance to the picture painted by Google. So let me conclude by highlighting just a few of these. First, uh, the term data entered the English language in the 17th century and uh, became naturalized during the 18th. Uh, based on results from ECHO, it appears that the term data saw increasing use during the 18th century relative to the total text base. During the 18th century, uh, data remained principally ter a term of art, and yet by centuries end, its range had been extended to a variety of new disciplines, and its use had become much more common. And so this was uh, one of the very basic searches, the word data by decade, and I, uh, this actually only represents about 2,300 of the 10,000 instances uh, because uh, the large, uh, larger number of them, although they were in books printed in England, uh, were in fact Latin usages, uh, not English usages. So that reduced the, the, the work substantially. Uh, what you see there is that uh, in 1700, uh, the term data appears in roughly 0.4, uh, or 0.3, I'm sorry, percent of works in the echo corpus. And by the end of the century, it appears in 3%. So uh, it's still a term of art, it's still not an especially common term at the end of the century, uh, but it's seen a tenfold increase in usage and the increase is fairly steady. And that's relative usage, uh, con considering the, the size of the data. Uh, of course, the term data would not receive a broader cultural application until later. In the last decade of the 18th century, less than 4% of works uh, in ECHO employ it. By contrast, the term fact appears in about 28% of works in the corpus. But the trend for data is notable. Uh, its, in, its usage increases clearly. Moreover, at the beginning of the 18th century, approximately 70% of published instances of the term data were italicized, suggesting that users still regarded it as a foreign word. By the end of the century, only about 20% of instances were italicized. And so these trends, I think, uh, nicely reinforce each other. Second, data came into English principally through discussions of mathematics and theology. By the end of the 18th century, usages, dominant usages, were in new and largely empirical areas of study, including finance and natural history. Third, over the course of the 18th century, the main sense of the term data shifted. At the beginning of the century, uh, it usually referred to principles, facts, or values given and not susceptible to question. At the end of the century, the term typically referred to facts and evidence determined by experiment, experience, or collection. It had not only become possible, but usual to think of data as the result of investigation. This represents a near total semantic inversion. And while this inversion did not produce the 20th century meaning of data, it did provide one of its key enabling conditions. In sum, the work so far has shown that there are definitive quantifiable trends in the usage of the term data in the 18th century. It took some fairly heavy manual work with the data derived from ECHO to get a good read on this. 
But having done it, it is clear that the very first tool that I employed in my uh, pursuit of the history of the term, the Oxford English Dictionary, produced an account that is quite well mirrored in the quantitative results. Now, I suppose in some ways this observation should be disappointing. After all, I did a lot of work creating a richly coded body of data on data, only to find that 19th century crowdsourcing had already cracked the nut. But to the contrary, I find it uh, very interesting how good the OED turns out to be on this matter. For the moment, it's a win for 19th century reading practices, but I don't expect this to hold up for very long. If you follow the various strategies of the OED, you know that even that venerable institution is moving to embrace a data-driven model. And that fact alone suggests that we should all be ready to engage with quantitative humanities in a strong, critical fashion. In any event, I think that my eventual results will be good news for reading, even if they are not bad news for data. What is more, as we've seen with Priestley, the techniques made possible by the datification of our archive are in many ways consistent with ideas and writing that are native to my period, the 18th century. In other words, at least in this corpus, there is a kind of pleasing echo of the material and the techniques. In the end, what does the history of data have to tell us about data today? I've made the case for several possible answers, but let me emphasize one that is supported by the numbers but not generated by them. From the beginning, data was a rhetorical concept. Data means that which is given prior to argument. As a consequence, its sense always shifts with argumentative strategy and context, and with the history of both. The rise of the modern natural and social sciences beginning in the 18th century created new conditions of argument and new assumptions about facts and evidence, but the pre-existing semantic structure of the term data gave it flexibility in these changing conditions. It is tempting to want to give data an essence to define exactly what kind of fact it is. <coughs> But this misses important things about why the concept has proven so useful over these past several centuries and why it has emerged as a culturally central category in our own time. When we speak of data, we make no assumptions about its veracity. It may be that the electronic data that we collect and transmit has no relationship to the world outside other than the reality that it constructs. This fact is essential to our current usage it was no less so in the early modern period, but in our age of communication, it is this rhetorical aspect of the term which has made it unavoidable. Thank you.